Uh, next up, we have Sarang Noether, uh, one of the other paid members of the Monero Research Lab, and he is here to speak about transaction efficiency then and now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm back again. I've been randomly appearing throughout the conference to uh, help out as needed. So I will be talking today about transaction efficiency, um, a little bit then um, and a little bit now. And part of the goal is to kind of give a nice kind of look back to how our transactions have evolved in terms of size and time efficiency over time um, and kind of what we're doing to improve those. So I'm not really going to be talking about kind of like big, fancy new scaling solutions, but um, just some things that we've done in the past and just a, kind of a nice opportunity to look at where transactions might go in the near future. So click. I see why people hate this. Huh? Ha-ha, thank you. No. OK, there we go. We're good. All right, first of all, my usual disclaimer, um, I speak only for myself. Monero Research Lab is a work group of the Monero project, but everyone in it kind of works on their own um, according to their own research agendas. So I'm just speaking for myself here, and um, also a financial disclosure that I do receive funding support from the Monero community through the CCS, um, like Brandon was saying. So first of all, when I'm talking about transaction efficiency, what do I mean? So I'm not particularly talking about anything to do with privacy here, although transaction efficiency can open the door to kind of changing parameters in the protocol over time that can affect privacy. Um, things like ring size is the most common example. But we're gonna be looking at three particular aspects of efficiency. The first of which is space. That's a rocket which goes into space. The second one is generation time. And by generation time, I mean if I want to construct a transaction that transfers funds from my wallet to someone else, that obviously is going to take some amount of time to do signatures and different kinds of constructions. Um, there's a whole bunch that goes into that. And the third thing is verification time, which is one that we actually tend to care a lot more about. And that is saying, for example, if I am a device that's coming online and I need to obtain the blockchain over the network and then go through and verify and ensure that all the transactions on it are valid, well, each of those is going to take some verification time. And it's interesting to look at all three of these because there is an interplay between them. Um, and there's different use cases for why we might want to care about one over the other. For space, obviously, bandwidth and storage are a big thing. You know, we basically have to carry the blockchain around with us forever unless we come up with some fancy new thing to do with that. So as the chain gets larger with larger transactions, well, that's a problem. We want to minimize that. As well as network bandwidth. If transactions are very large, you know, there's bandwidth to, uh, to consider at that time. For generation time, we're typically a little bit less concerned about that. Um, some low capacity devices with limited compute capability may care about that. And of course, in extreme cases, well, you know, we could you know, tune our network parameters to be you know, a whole bunch of things. We could increase ring size right now to be almost any value we want, but that would greatly affect generation time as one example. So um, if transactions take a full minute to do, well, that's gonna hamper usability. So we'd like to minimize that if possible, but transaction generation tends to be kind of a one-off event. Like, I wanna send funds. If it takes a couple seconds, well, maybe that's not a big deal for my device. But verification time typically has to do with something that you're going to do over and over again. If I'm syncing a node, I have a lot of transactions to synchronize and verify, so I need the verification time for each of them to be as small as possible. Like, something on the order of a second is not acceptable for that. We're talking about something on the order of, you know, as low as possible, millisecond times. And so there's different levels of things that we can do to optimize these. So um, I call these different levels because some of them are very low and some of them are a little bit higher. So one of them is low-level cryptographic operations. And we do tend to tweak these from time to time. Um, and there's a lot of underlying library stuff that one could do, different kinds of hardware acceleration. And that's mostly out of the scope of this talk. But we're going to go a little bit higher and talk about other constructions, which have to do with things like range proofs and signatures, and different things that we build out of those low-level cryptographic operations. And then I also talked about protocol parameters. Those are things that we can kind of just change at will, um, but that do have an impact on usability. Again, ring size is the most common example. We can change ring size whenever we want according to the protocol. Um, but there's reasons why we might want to change it to certain values or not change it to certain values. So on this talk, I'm going to primarily be talking about constructions, but these, all, these other ones all come into play. And just an example, there's our classic chain growth graph. Yay. <laughs> you can see that it was doing pretty well over time. I bet you can guess where ring CT was activated when we started hiding amounts and commitments. I'll give you a hint. It's where it starts going up and up and up and up. And I bet you can maybe tell when bulletproofs was activated, um, which was a huge, huge thing in the chain in terms of uh, chain growth and also verification time, is when it levels out again. Doesn't quite level out as much, but it's still much better. So we'll be talking about these things. <clears throat> 
So one thing we're going to look at, um, in particular when it comes to transaction efficiency, is the idea of a ring signature. And we've talked about ring signatures a lot. Um, the idea of our ring signature has evolved over time. Um, the, the confidential transaction protocol that we use, which hides amounts and proves balance, actually does get worked into the ring signature. So we use kind of this multi-level ring signature. Sounds like multi-level marketing. A multi-level ring signature that has to do with uh, proving key ownership, of course, one out of many keys that you're spending. It also actually helps to demonstrate uh, transaction balance by some cool stuff involving the algebraic properties of commitments that we don't necessarily need to care about. And it also helps to ensure that the key image that we generate, and remember, key images are produced uh, from the signatures. You can think about it that way. And they are used to check uh, against double spending. Um, and if someone could produce a key image dishonestly, then you'd run into the risk of a double spend attempt. That would be, well, they'd be successful. Um, but fortunately, as far as we know, the ring signature scheme is provably correct, and we don't run into that problem. So we're going to particularly look at how the ring signature has evolved over time and what we're going to be doing with it. The second thing that we're going to look at has to do with uh, what we do with output data. So ring signatures, they have to do with both inputs and output, outputs, but they scale primarily based on the number of inputs. Um, and that, of course, means, like, what is our ring size? And, of course, we have a uh, different ring signature for spending multiple inputs, each of which has its own ring of a true spend and decoys. But in terms of output data, when I'm generating outputs that are destined for, you know, possibly me or possibly some other entity, um, there's different stuff that has to go along with the output. Um, but the two things that we need to be able to successfully communicate very, very well are both the amount and the mask. Um, so the amount is pretty obvious. Every output has associated with it um, an amount in Monero that I'm going to be spending in that generated output. But remember, we also hide amounts. And we do that in a so-called Peterson commitment. And a Peterson commitment basically takes the amount, and it takes a piece of secret data that ideally no one else knows called the mask. We'll call it R in this case. And it smushes them together algebraically in a way that it's, you can't really go and undo very efficiently. And we do a couple things with that. In one case, we move to the left of the diagram, and I need to be able to communicate securely those particular elements, the amount V and the mask R, to the recipient. The recipient needs to know what the amount is to verify that it was all correct. Um, and the recipient also actually needs to know what the mask was in order for that recipient to be able to do things with those funds later. Otherwise, they lose, effectively lose control over them. So we need to be able to communicate that. And we'll talk about why that's been made more efficient. That's why it's in gray. It's my little uh, color scheme there. And what we also do is then we take those, uh, those pieces of data and we put them into this so-called Peterson commitment, commit on the right. And that spits out some algebraic object that we can use. And what we need to do with that, um, we end up later putting that into the ring signature in order to prove balance of a transaction without revealing what the amount is to the world. But we also have to associate it with it a so-called range proof. And the range proof is basically a way to prove in zero knowledge that the amount is contained within some reasonable range. And the reason we do that is to prevent effectively something akin to a negative value or an overflow. If we didn't do this, it'd be possible to cleverly, or maybe even not so cleverly, construct a transaction that appears to balance, but ends up sending absurd amounts of money. And the reason with this has to do with the math that we use involving finite fields that we're not terribly interested in. But suffice it to say, it's extremely important that we have a range proof that shows this. That is also something that we've been able to highly optimize over time. And the answer to that one, as you may have guessed if you know about this, is bulletproofs. So let's talk about the ring signature and what we've done with that. So we currently use a, a scheme called MLSAG, and I'm not going to bother saying what that means. It's not important here. But they effectively prove ownership of outputs that we're spending without revealing which output specifically we are spending. So the idea of constructing a group of outputs, one of which is the true spend, and the other of which are decoys that we pull from the chain. But as I said, the type of ring signature actually does show some more, though. It shows, in particular, that you control one output among a given set without revealing which one, absent external information. We also need to prove that the key image that's used to detect double spending was generated honestly and correctly so that I can't just generate some random key image that appears to have not been spent before when I'm really double spending. And the third thing is that the hidden transaction amounts balance. And it has to do with math on the Peterson commitments that we talked about before. Now, the downside to this, and there'll be folks who are going to be talking later in the protocol session about ways we might be able to get around this, is that they scale linearly with the ring size in both space, signing time, and verifying time. Which means that if we decide to just say, I don't know, double the ring size, we're effectively mostly going to be doubling the size of the ring signature, as well as the time it takes to generate and the time it takes to verify. So the scaling on this is not great. So could we use 1,000 ring members for every transaction right now? Well, you could, but the scaling is going to make it essentially unusable. 
So what's the new hotness we have? So this is something we actually have not deployed yet, but we've been talking about for a while. Um, it's a new scheme called CLSAG. C standing for compact or compressed or whatever. We're terrible at naming things. Um, so this is something that was actually originally proposed by an anonymous contributor, Random Run. Um, and there's actually a GitHub issue that talks about it. And it was further refined um, by other Monero contributors, um, including me and including Brandon as well, formalized, um, proven correct, and eventually developed into code with the collaboration of Monero Moo. The idea with CLSAG is it's basically a drop-in replacement to the existing MLSAG ring signature scheme, in effect that it does the exact same thing and shows the same things mathematically, all those things I listed about balance and ownership and key image, but much, much, much more efficiently. And the way it does that is instead of using these different output signing keys and some commitment signing keys that show all this stuff together, instead of including those separately in the ring signature, which increases the space and the time, we can use this clever like linear combination smushing technique to very securely smush it. That's the technical term, we smush it. It turns out you have to smush it very carefully, otherwise you can do funky things with it. But if you're very careful about how you smush things together, these output keys and these commitment keys, you can effectively do a full drop-in replacement of what we had before, but it's more efficient. Now, this still scales linearly. So if I were to double the ring size, I would still double the CL SAG signature size. But the nice thing is, overall, if I compare them to the corresponding existing ML SAG, they're gonna be both smaller and faster in generation and verification time. So the scaling is the same, but like overall, they are better. And in particular, security is more formally proven in this than in the old one. So how good is it? I have a lot of plots here. Red generally means bad, and green generally means good. So if you don't like math or numbers, red is bad, green is good. So in terms of size, for our current network-enforced ring size of 11, so 10 decoys in a true spender, an ML SAG signature currently takes up 768 bytes. Once we switch, and again, this is still being worked out when we'd want to do this, we want to get all this audited properly. At this point, we essentially have the size of the ring signature. So a CL SAG for the equivalent signature size is only 448 bytes, which is fantastic. Um, and in effect, the larger the ring size gets, the closer we actually get to dropping it by half. Someone's having a good time out there with uh, dropping a nice beat. So that's a signature size, which is fantastic. What about the timings on those? They're also very good. They're not quite as abruptly great as the size. The size is fantastic. If we can like cut the size of something in Monero in half, that's amazing. But in terms of timing, it's still pretty good. So on the left, I have the signing time, which is part of the, the um, transaction generation. And like I said, that is typically less important to us than the stuff on the right, which is verification. Um, so again, this is taken just from a, a representative test machine. It's like a 2.1 gigahertz Opteron or something. So your mileage may vary. But for this particular case, um, the signing time of an 11 ring existing MLSAG signature was about 13 milliseconds. So not bad. It turns out the CLSAG signing time is going to be about 11.5 milliseconds. So you know, not bad. And the verification time is right about 13 milliseconds for MLSAG. And in fact, for CLSAG, it's down to about 10.3, which is about, if I remember the numbers on that, it's about 20% faster, which is fantastic. Now, unfortunately, that speed up only applies to CLSAG signatures and not with existing sync. But again, this means that any CLSAG signatures that we generate going forward are going to be faster to verify than if we had not deployed this code. There are some speed ups that we can de uh, deploy to MLSAG, but they're not nearly as good as this. So that's ring signatures. We have the possibility to make them much better. The CLSAG code is essentially ready to go. So we'd like to get it audited and reviewed, but at that time, we could throw it into Monero pretty, pretty easily. But let's also talk about commitments. We're all afraid of commitment, but don't be afraid of commitment. Commitment's good. Like I said, all amounts are represented um, by an algebraic structure called a Peterson commitment. It happens to have a globally fixed base if you care about this. But effectively what I do is I algebraically kind of add together these things in a clever elliptic curve way, both the value and the mask. And like I said, the recipient has to know the value and the mask, V and R we call them, in order to reconstruct that commitment and later use it in a ring signature to be able to spend that output but I want no one else to know what those values are. So previously what happened was both of the values were essentially encrypted. I'm putting this in quotes. Um, it was a very, very straightforward obfuscation scheme that just involved like modular addition. But they were encrypted using a particular transaction shared secret that both the sender and the recipient knew. And if you care, it's a hash function that's constructed in that way. And if you don't, whatever, it's fine. So the way that we effectively obfuscated the value was we took that value and we did some iterated hashes on this thing that only the sender and the recipient know. No one else can reconstruct these. And that gave like the encrypted 
value, encrypted amount. And we did a similar thing with the mask, R, but using a slightly different iterated hash. So the idea is that if you are neither the sender nor the recipient, you cannot generate that kind of offset, and you cannot reconstruct those amounts. If you are the recipient, you can just do a simple subtraction and kind of undo this, and then know what the value and mask are, and then you can do whatever you want with your funds. So not bad. But the new hotness for this is called being clever. What we realized was, <laughs> is it turns out that like, this construction is a little bit wasteful. In particular, if they are generated randomly, because remember I said this whole Peterson mask thing is just supposed to be some random value. It's supposed to be some randomly generated value only known to the sender and the recipient. But if it's generated randomly, both the mask and this like, obfuscated version of the mask, they both look random and they're only known to a sender and recipient. So in that case, why do we bother including this like, specially crafted version of the encrypted mask in the transaction at all? So instead, what we do is we don't actually send that anymore. So instead, the sender and recipient both directly compute this random-looking Peterson mask thing just from a hash function of things that they both know. And we include like a little bit of a, a fixed salt in there to kind of shake things up and make sure that it can't be accidentally reused later. It turns out if we do this and don't have to include this data we previously did, we can save a fairly small amount, but you know, like a non-negligible amount, of 32 bytes per output. And keep in mind, of course, like most transactions include at least two outputs. Uh, things like pool payouts could include up to 16 outputs. So this scales pretty well. So nice little small savings we can get. But it turns out this is actually still wasteful. So the new hotness is still being more clever. It turns out that the amount can't be larger than eight bytes or 64 bits. Remember, we're restricting the amount range using these range proofs, which I'll talk about later. Um, but effectively, what we're doing is we're still representing this amount as a fairly large scalar value in the field that we're working with. It turns out it's 32 bytes. Like, all of our uh, algebraic quantities are basically represented by 32 bytes. So the solution here, instead of doing this, uh, this kind of obfuscation and sending 32 bytes that really represents an eight byte amount, is instead to restrict the representation of the amount to its known fixed limited value of eight bytes, and then obfuscate it using an XOR operation to save this kind of padding of 24 bytes per output. And if you care, that's roughly how we do it mathematically. And what the recipient can do is, the recipient can basically undo this with an equivalent XOR operation and recover it into this full 32 byte scalar that you need to do math with it later on. So if you like math, there it is. If you don't like math, here's a graph. Remember, red is old, which is bad. Green is good, which is new. It turns out per output, previously, these two values took up 64 bytes. Not a ton in the grand scheme of things. We're talking transactions on the order of kilobytes, but still non-negligible. We were able to drop that substantially down to eight. It was great. I couldn't even put the label of eight inside the bar. It's so low. So it's pretty good. A fairly small uh, improvement, but an improvement nonetheless to transaction size. This really doesn't have anything to do with efficiency in terms of time, but it does in terms of space. And that's pretty great. The last thing I'll talk about is something we have already deployed. And by the way, this thing we had back here, this was recently deployed as well. So the CL SAG signatures are not deployed yet. Um, this stuff is. And the next thing, range proofs, also is. There was a whole big hullabaloo about this for a fantastic reason. And that's because range proofs were very, very large. So like I said, amounts are represented as commitments. That's the motto of my talk here. And balance is basically proven using some algebra on these commitments. You can add and subtract them in, in very straightforward ways. Like I said, amounts have to be restricted to avoid this kind of overflow where you could appear to have a transaction that balances while really pulling some funny business and paying yourself a ton of money. So we have to show that the committed value with its random Peterson mask that we talked about, we need to show that that value is in some fixed range. And like I said, that range is 64 bits, so I need to prove that that value, when expressed as an integer, is within the range of 0 and 2 to the 64. So the overall strategy, both with bulletproofs and with the previous version, is to show that I can take this value v, decompose it to 64 bits, each of which is either a 0 or a 1, so it's an honest-to-goodness bit, um, that actually sums back up to the correct value. But I don't want to actually reveal what the value of those bits is. The whole point is this needs to be done in zero knowledge, um, but I need to be able to show that this statement is true, that I can decompose the value into like honest-to-goodness bits of the appropriate length. So as an example, if my value was 13 in base 10, that's 1101 1, 1 in base 2, I can basically break it apart in two bits. That's just how binary decomposition works, and I can use that to reconstruct the value later. The old way we did it was with this kind of bitwise ring signature. Um, and that, if you remember back to that graph I had of the chain growth, like we had this like, gigantic spike where all of a sudden the slope of that graph just got huge. The reason was exactly because of these. 
The previous method was a sort of bitwise, we call them Borromean range proof, and it actually used like a, a little bit separate version of a ring signature. So we actually had multiple uses of ring signatures, and one of them was for this. And effectively what you did is, for each of these bits, you generated um, effectively a separate kind of sub-commitment. So you had these extra 64 commitments, each of which was to one of these bits, and you basically constructed these commitments with masks that did some clever math when you summed them back up again, and you basically built a ring signature over each of these bit commitments to show that it was either a zero or a one, and it was this whole big shebang, and then to verify it, you had to take this big weighted sum of these commitments, you were able to show that it recovered the correct amount, um, and also verify the ring signature so that you were convinced that each of those bits was a zero or a one. What sucked is that it scaled in space and time linearly with the number of bits, which was not good. So bulletproofs are the new hotness. Instead, they reduce this range assertion to some clever vector inner product statements, and they prove all this in zero knowledge, and they like smush it all the way down. And what's great about this is it achieves exactly the same thing on exactly the same kinds of commitments, but it scales logarithmically, which is much, much slower than linearly. And in particular, a prover can include multiple output commitment range proofs in the exact same proof, which makes things even smaller, it turns out generation and verification, while they are still linear in the bit length, we have some tricks we can use to speed that up. And I can also verify a set of proofs in a large batch for almost no additional cost, which is great because when we verify these, if I'm syncing a new node, we have to do this a lot. So what happens? Well, in the standard two output time, verification time at least in this case, um, the proving time actually increases from the old style to the new style by about 50% you know, or so. But the verification time that we care about drops, in my case, from about 95 milliseconds down to 21, which is fantastic. And this extends out. For a 16 output, which is common in things like pool payouts, again, we increase the proving time, but the verification time drops substantially. That's the green stuff. And batch verification is even better. So if I wanted to verify, in batch, 128 different proofs from maybe different transactions with two outputs each, the overall total cost in the old way would have been 12 seconds, which is nuts. The total time here is 420 milliseconds, which means we save 97% on verification time. It's fantastic. And the size is even better. The red Borromean proofs with the number of outputs increases linearly, so it's a line. Whereas the bullet proofs, you almost can't see how it's increasing. The scaling is fantastic. It's almost nothing. So what does this all actually mean? So put this stuff all together, what do typical transactions look like then and now? Well, transaction size on the left, an average 2-2 two, two transaction, two ins, two outs, used to be about 13 kilobytes. With all of these optimizations, once they're in place, we drop that down to 1.9. That's fantastic. That's an 85% savings on space overall from where we were. And in terms of verification time, if we do this batched verification, which we absolutely can do, we end up dropping the verification time from about 121 milliseconds per transaction all the way down to about 23. And that's another 81% savings on verification time. So, these all look fantastic. I love graphs that go down like that. It's fantastic. But keep in mind, these are not complete scaling solutions. These are very incremental. Bulletproofs, while you know, it's still good, it's still kind of an incremental improvement on verification. They are useful, but they're still just incremental improvements to basically slow the blockchain growth, which still increases with the number of transactions and outputs. And we want to basically slow down the speed, or sorry, speed up the new node sync time by lowering the verification cost as much as possible. We have other options. Um, we have some that are like these sublinear fixed decoy transaction protocols, like OmniRing was discussed yesterday. Lelantis is going to be discussed later today. We could try to move to something that's more of a full anonymity transaction protocol. Um, you can actually do this with bulletproofs, but you get a very poor verification scaling. You can do some of the older style snarks, which as we know are toxic because they include a certain element of trust, although they do get excellent space and time scaling compared to what we have now. There's some newer style approaches that may be non-toxic. They have better scaling than we have now, but not, or better scaling than bulletproofs, for example, but not quite where we want them to be. Or we can try to work on things like off-chain transaction layers involving things like atomic swaps and payment channels, um, but we don't quite have the plumbing in place for those just yet. So this is where transactions were. This is where they are now. Um, if you're interested, I have uh, stuff up on GitHub where my research ends up living um, and some stuff on GitLab as well. So thank you for your time. I'll be glad to answer questions. Tall graphs bad, small graphs good. That's the motto. Uh, just a quick question on the atomic swaps. Do you see that being feasible, and do you might do, might you know when? <laughs> if and when, right? 
Um, so atomic swaps are fairly tricky. You need certain kinds of plumbing in place, like non-interactive refund transactions. Um, and you also have, you need to make sure that the math basically plays well and is interoperable across the different curves that might be used. Um, Monero uses a particular elliptic curve that is not common to things like Bitcoin. Um, and there's also some structures that Bitcoin has in place, um, like being able to prove uh, knowledge of things using like hash pre-images that our protocol doesn't support. So we have some ideas in mind. There's gonna be one option that's gonna be talked about later today, so stick around. Um, but, so we have ideas. Um, it's not quite there yet, as you will learn. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. Um, it, it turns out that it's very tricky because the Monero protocol is not as expressive as things like Bitcoin and a lot of the plumbing is different. It's a very unsatisfactory answer, but it's best I can do. Okay, a quick question. Yeah. If I was going to keep overall verification time constant from the current situation right now, what's your estimate of how much we could increase the mixing by? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so we ran the numbers for the CLSAG signature verification only, um, and it turns out you could maybe add like one or two to the anonymity set and still have the verification time be the same as with an 11 ring ML SAG. So, I don't know, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so effectively you'd have a ring size of 13 if you were just to say, what can we do to, to maintain the verification time we have now on that? So it's, it's not a lot. Because again, that, the savings you get in time is not as good as the savings you get in space. I had to step out for a second, so sorry if I oh, missed sure. this. But, um, with CLSAG, it sounds like, I mean, like you mentioned, that's pretty much ready to go. Do you foresee moving to that no matter what Lenantis and Omniring look like as we learn more about them? Do you envision just like going to CLSAG and then switching to something else later on if they are promising? Yes, I absolutely think that we should do that. And again, this is all contingent on um, passing both audits of the math and of the code. So everything's ready. We just need to make sure that it's absolutely correct. Yes, they, I think it's a, a no-brainer to go and move to CLSAG. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it's a lot less work than overhauling the entire transaction protocol. So we might as well do it to you know, do what we can for our users now and then see what the future can hold because it's kind of uncertain. You know, we have something now. We may have something in the future too. Hey, Saran. Uh, I've got a kind of double-loaded question. Uh, so refund transactions, uh, I know that's something that uh, Knack spent a bit of time on, I seem to remember. Yes. I just wondered like, how they might play into this as well. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's important to differentiate between interactive and non-interactive refund transactions. The idea behind interactive refund transactions is can I efficiently encode a refund address in some safe way into a transaction? Um, and Knack had an idea for this. There were a couple ideas for possibly how to do it. Um, but um, in terms of kind of the plumbing you'd need for other things like payment channels and atomic swaps, you need non-interactive refunds, um, which, does not, which does not require um, the sender to you know, accurately and honestly include this information. Um, and that's much, much harder to do from a protocol level. And we're actually gonna hear a talk later on about you know, what it would take to actually do that. Um, I don't know if that answers what you were it getting at. It does, my, my question was sort of double-loaded because mm -hmm. I, I was also wanted to hear from you like, um, what's your initial um, what's your initial uh, view on the the recent like Omniring and there's been a couple of papers recently that mm -hmm. talked about basically uh, improving our kind of ring signatures. Just wondered like what work you've been up to. In oh yeah, yeah. So um, a few papers came out Omniring, which you heard about, um, Lalantis, which you're going to hear about. Um, there was another one called RCT3, Ring CT 3.0, um, which was also mentioned in the Omniring paper. Um, they're all very interesting and all slightly different approaches. The problem is like, I don't see any one as being a clear absolute winner. Um, so with, with Atlantis, there is an issue with a self-spend problem that you need to overcome. And with OmniRing, the, the scaling is, is good, um, but it's a question of whether or not you know, we can take advantage of some things like batching, which aren't quite there yet, in order to get the absolute time down a bit further. Um, and Ring CT3, um, I need to, I had some questions about batching that I haven't fully answered yet. So I like them all, and I can't wait for one of them to be the clear winner, but I don't think they're quite there yet. So we'll do what we can right now, and then work really hard toward getting something better in the future. One more question. We have one more, okay, cool. I'm so popular. Or I did a terrible job. <laughs> you did a great job. Those Yay. plots were awesome. Seeing I love this, plots, man. Yeah. Seeing, you, you've done so well. I guess what I'm oh, asking no, no, we've is, done so well. This was, this was not yeah. me. This yeah. is a lot of people. Indeed. So looking far in the future, do you imagine? I, I the, cannot look far in the future, but okay. <laughs> fair enough. The, the, the next stage, can we do this again? 
can this get that much more efficient ever? And what do you imagine could do that? I mean, I think, you know, subject to kind of like the limitations of the universe that are in place. So for example, like there's certain verification asymptotic limits that you're always going to hit. Um, but if you're asking, you know, like what is the state of the art going to improve? Probably, you know, before bulletproofs came out, everyone thought, ah, range proofs, they'll always be terrible. And then all of a sudden they got fantastic. Um, and with ML SAG, we didn't see a way to improve that. And then, you know, random runs idea came out and we saw how to compress these things. So, you know, I'm never going to say never, um, but, you know, there are some kind of fundamental asymptotic limits of the universe in place. So the best we can do is kind of try to reduce some of the constants associated with them to have the same scaling. Like I said, ML SAG and CL SAG have the same scaling, but one is just absolutely better than the other for our use case. So hope so.